So as you guys saw in the morning, we, we wanted to start actually building LM applications ourselves instead of, as opposed to only kind of focusing on the infra and making it kind of cheaper and faster. Uh, this way we kind of actually experience the problems that you guys will hopefully a lot sooner and actually make the whole experience and products a lot better. Uh, so the first thing that we did was build a, a RAG application. And this is like a canonical use case, right? Everybody has their own data. A lot of tech companies have their own documentation. So this is usually the first use case that a lot of teams gravitate towards, just making it easier for people to work with their products. Um, so we decided to do the same. And you know, our Ray, as, uh, as many of you know, does a lot of different things. So for us, it was very useful to want to build something like this on top of all the different capabilities and functions that Ray can do, uh, and then just help developers do things a lot faster. Uh, and better as well. And to that topic, I want to emphasize the two values you're going to have when you build such an application are the underlying documents. And there, there has been really great work by the right documentation team, um, yeah. including Angelina and others. Um, and then the other one is like users and, and questions from users. So like if you have these two things, then that makes it much easier to build this kind of application. <clears throat> yeah. Actually, I just want to quick, see a quick show of hands. How many folks internally, or I guess externally, have started building RAG-based applications at work? Okay. Oh, that's a lot of you, okay. So I'd love to hear like everyone else's insights tonight as well. Um, the things that we will share are very empirically driven. So if you find you found a different insight, for example, like chunking size that we'll talk about, please definitely share those kinds of things because we're very early uh, as a, kind of a community in this space. So it, it'd be great to hear kind of different people's take on all this. Um, so obviously kind of starting simple, we started our whole application with just seeing how will a base LLM do we tried it with GPT-4, Llama 7B, 70B, and we would just ask a question, and very quickly, you know, we'd realize that these models have no context or very little context of how things work, and if they did, it'll be outdated, right? Uh, September 21 sometimes, and Ray looked, uh, I think, very different back then, uh, if it even had access to it. Um, so we very quickly got to actually building the RAG app. This is kind of like the high-level overview here, um, but this is the forward pass once you have a query. So assume the vector database is already made, We'll talk about what that looks like in a second. But somebody asks a question, the query gets embedded by an embedding model. You have a couple options there. Then that gets passed into a vector database. And now you can have a couple different options for how you calculate distance. But that embedded query is now used to fetch the top K context. You have options for how many top K is as well. Uh, once you get those contexts, you can now feed in both the text from those contexts and the text from the query, both into the LLM. Now you've augmented the base LLM with this additional context to be able to hopefully generate uh, a correct response. The actual uh, vector database piece here, um, simplifying, we'll zoom into each of these, but basically we have a bunch of data sources, so we started with our Ray documentation, um, and then we wanted to be able to load them, so this is very similar to what we did this morning. Um, and this was the first kind of step where we started to get uh, a little experimental, the actual like chunking, right? How do we want to represent our data? Um, and maybe I'll let Philip talk about the different strategies we tried, but the thing, the naive thing that everyone does is just randomly chunk this, right? I want to just set chunk size 100 or 300, chunk overlap 50, and just go through all of my different documents. But that, that starts to uh, not be as effective. Uh, so we started thinking about a lot of other ways to more uh, efficiently chunk the data. So one thing we um, did then was um, to use the sections of the HTML document. Um, I would say there's two benefits of that. One is that you can give, you also want to give the refer, uh, in some applications you want to give the references on where you got the information from. And then you can give a lot more precise references instead of, instead of people, uh, pointing people to the whole like long document, you can just um, um, point them to the reference and then when they click the link, it will, the browser will like, go to the right section. And that's very valuable. And then the second one is um, the sections often give the right sort of like first idea of like where something ends. So like um, it makes sure that there's no like um, um, chunking in between sections. <clears throat> that's right. A um, lot of different stra other strategies we could do here. While we're doing all of this chunking, we tried to keep it as generalizable as possible. Um, we're still working towards this actually, but we want to try to come up with a template. Maybe we can do kind of an open source solution as well where this would work for the vast majority of people's um, documents, right? Not necessarily has to be for a library, but any kind of HTML documents. But um, after we chunk this, uh, we basically have all these different chunks that we can work with. We now feed it into an embedding model. We'll talk about which ones we experimented with in a second. Um, and then after we have this semantic representation of all of our different chunks, we can now index that into our vector database. 
Um, the actual content that we're putting into our vector database is the text, the source, and the embedding as well. A lot of different options for vector databases as well. I think in the last uh, maybe year and a half, we have had an explosion of new databases that we've never kind of heard of. Um, but um, we, we kind of stuck with uh, Postgres, uh, nice and simple. We've worked with it for many years. Um, I think even Postgres has a lot of up and coming features around this. Honestly, our, our advice here would be to go with what you're already familiar with or comfortable with or what your team uses. Um, but a lot of the new ones are, are uh, definitely worth looking at. They're coming up with a lot of mm, like LLM app specific features, which could be um, a really interesting feature as well. Um, awesome. So now when we repeat all this across all of our docs, you have your vector database actually created. Um, we'll talk about how to update that in a second. But to actually now do the retrieval, you have a query, you embed the query um, using ideally the same embedding model, and you have a query embedding now. Now you can pass that over to the database and use different distance metrics. Uh, we use cosine distance, uh, cosine similarity to retrieve the top k chunks from this. And once you have the chunks, now you can feed in the text from the relevant uh, sources and the query itself to the LM and get the response. So any questions so far with this kind of V1? Yes. Oh, sorry, one second. We have a runner. What was the pros and cons uh, building vector DB on top of Postgres versus using something out of the box like VV8 or ComaDB? Um, one pro is definitely if you already have expertise and maybe you already have some data in there, there's this vector extension called PG Vectors that you can just basically create a new data type um, and then and then you can like use all existing machinery. You can even like combine it with existing like filters and stuff like that to like filter down. Um, 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 uh, and, and then, like, one of the possible downsides is once you have get at a very large scale. So if you, if you have a huge amount of document, then it might not be the right solution anymore. But, I mean, it depends on your application. <clears throat> yeah. Our, our, all of our Ray Docs, I think, comes out to less than a gig, if I recall correctly. So, yeah, it really depends on your use case. But um, use case for, you know, database like VB8, there are a lot of great integrations that we see almost on a weekly basis. I think Cohere is like re-ranking is now something you can get out of the box. So there are some amazing features. So I would, uh, to get started, maybe don't uh, experiment with everything. Just go with what you're already familiar with. But um, as you start getting towards production and for some of these more kind of niche features, it might be worth exploring some of the others. Um, There's also Elasticsearch. I think it's also coming out with more things yeah. in that direction. So it's worth looking at your existing things, if they can do it, um, and then looking at the other things. I mean, it depends on your use case. Yeah. Sorry, any other questions? No? Okay. Yes. Where are you? Oh, there you are. Um, on the last slide. Uh, um, uh -huh. Yeah, is there a limit on the number of tokens in the contest? There is. And each model has different limits. We'll talk about these as well. Um, yeah, great, great question. You, when we do our experiments, we try to treat them all as independent like uh, the chunk size, but you can't, right? Each model is different, and the number of chunks times the chunk size together dictates how, mu like how much context you can fill in. So I'll talk about that, but, um, and we'll talk about the need for uh, LLMs with higher context windows as well. And generally, that's the trend that we should be going towards. Uh, but great question. We'll, we'll get to that. There's, there's also two things, like some of the um, uh, models have sort of like hard limits, maybe like 512 tokens or so. And then there's also things where like they might not work super well in like different regimes. So it's worth experimenting. And also, if you if you uh, if your data dictates longer chunks, it's also worth experimenting with using multiple embeddings for each chunk, and then like um, looking up and then and then retrieving the larger document um, based on your retrieval. <clears throat> and the embedding models also have cutoffs as well. Okay. Um, so now, before we kind of talk, get to our experiments, we'll briefly talk about how we're performing evaluation. Um, first, we'll look at kind of the component-wise. And to us, there are two major components we wanted to focus on. I think there are other pieces here as well. Uh, but for us, first is like the whole retrieval workflow itself. So assume that you have um, uh, kind of the golden source, right? And let's just simplify this and say there's one golden source for, let's say, a particular query. I want to pass the query through our system, and I wanted to retrieve, let's say, top K context. If the golden source is in one of those top K, 
then we'll count that as a success. We'll count that as a hit. Um, so we use this kind of metric here to score our, just our retrieval process and isolate it away from kind of what's happening with the LLMs here. Um, similarly, we wanted to isolate just the LLM piece here. So forget about retrieving context. Assume you have the best source and the text from that best source, and assuming it fits in the LLM uh, context window. Um, given that best source text, how well can our LLM generate a response? And this, as you may notice, is a bit more um, generative, right? It's a bit, it definitely uh, not as objective as the previous one. Um, but we have these two scores to kind of compare the component-wise here. Now, with the uh, quality score on just the LLM side, here's kind of what it looks like. You have a question. We have the golden source. You get the text from it. We would ask a uh, large language model like GPT-4 to answer uh, using the source and the question give it give us an answer and then score that answer and then provide a reasoning for it and we could repeat this process across different evaluators so gpt4 llama 70b 7b etc um, and this was kind of like the first like vibe check right you can i think for arts we had over 200 data samples here and um, this is again why it's really important to work with an application that you really understand so we knew kind of the answers to a lot of these questions. We knew where it comes from. We knew what, kind of the, what the answer should look like. Um, so we're able to say, at the end of the day, GPT-4 is a quality evaluator that we can then use for subsequent experiments. Um, but Philip, if you want to mention like, what the other ones look like. So we basically, um, what we did is we looked through the whole data set. We annotated everything with GPT, including the reason. And then we, we basically removed the data points where we thought GPT-4 was not doing a good job on. Um, and then, and when we use that as the golden like um, comparison um, um, to use for, we also tried to use um, Llama 70B for evaluation. That was not. We had a feeling that the, the performance there was not as good. So there's still some leeway of, of like um, open source models to to become better. Yeah, and I think someone posted on social media, but I'm not sure if we're the ones to coin it. But there's a lot of nepotism going on with uh, Llama 70B. Uh, favor itself a lot, and you just see scores four out of five across the board. Um, so something to keep, uh, keep an eye on. Um, also, uh, on the scoring side, right, we picked one to five. We've like, worked with a lot of data sets where this is the case. I'm sure a lot of you have seen like, the Yelp reviews data set and things like that. Honestly, I think uh, in terms of interpretability, maybe a binary uh, kind of scoring might have been better. Uh, did this work or did this not work? But we kind of wanted to understand on a more granular level, like how, is, how, is, how are these LMs scoring something like this? How does this reasoning relate to that score? So we decided to do five. Um, and actually, when we do our experiments and compare it, I think we're kind of thankful that we had this kind of a spread. Yes? My question, my question, what logic decides the scoring? What, he's asking what logic decides the scoring. So thanks for that. Um, so do you want to talk about that so a little bit? You, you just ask the LM. So you, you give it the context. So you annotate the question with the like, golden source of where the answer can be found in the documentation. And then you ask um, the LM, given the, the context and the like, right answer, how would you evaluate the following proposed answer on a scale between 1 and 5? And then the LM will like, respond with the score. Um, in this case, GPT-4. You can, yeah. So in order to decide which LM to use as the evaluator, we just read through um, everything um, and, and what scores it gave and compared with, because we know about Ray, right? So we, we think about like, how would we think it does this answer do? And then we thought like, which one looks better? Um, I mean, it's, it's a bit of like black magic, but like, um, it, it, it's, it's a LMs here, black magic. <laughs> it's, um, I would say it's a first pass. So at the end of the day, we did this, so we get an, automatic pipeline. So yes. we can generate new ideas and then automatically um, evaluate um, 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 these ideas. Of course, um, as a second step, you then need to actually like, do evaluations with humans and, and yourself and things like that. Um, but it's, it's a good way to get sort of cheap, a cheap feedback loop on like, how well things are working. Yeah. Um, so we want to reduce this black magic as much as possible. So this piece here is not to evaluate the whole system, but just to know which one of these LMs is a good evaluator that we can use going forward. So I'll show you what the overall evaluation looked like. Um, so given the golden, golden source, which of these LLMs can generate a good answer and then actually a attach a good uh, or appropriate score to the answers that it's generating? This way we can build trust on a, one of these LLMs to be used as a judge going forward. Um, 
and by the way, this strategy, uh, we didn't necessarily come up with this. I think uh, the Langchain folks, Llama Index, many other kind of uh, LM app d developers online, I think the last couple months, have been using a similar philosophy of using an evaluator or judge as the, uh, at least the first pass evaluator. So with an evaluator set, we can now do like an overall um, evaluation here. And maybe let me show this diagram. It might be a little bit better. Um, so assume, uh, forget about the evaluator for a second. Let's say you have a certain configuration for your application. Uh, chunking logic, embedding model, any, any base LM that you're using, you're going to use that configuration of your RAG app to generate responses first. Then with, that gen with those generated responses, you're now going to use your evaluator, which you've previously evaluated, to now ask that evaluator on these generated responses, how, how, what's the quality of this response, what's the score you're giving it, what's the reasoning you're giving it. So this is a way for us to now actually, you've, you first trust the judge, and then now you're trusting the outputs of that judge across different configurations that you want to test. Um, I skipped this one, so let me just quickly talk about this. So these are, these are the experiments that we ran. There's a lot more that we could do across different components as well. Like a few that aren't here is maybe the distance metric you want to use in your vector database. Um, for chunking, maybe you want to combine these things. But uh, we did the, first we tried it like with and without context at all. Um, then we do uh, the number of chunks, the chunk size, the embedding models, uh, and then the base LLMs as well. So let's, uh, we're going to share a couple of things. Um, Actually, before that, I, so we were demoing this to somebody. Actually, we were demoing this to the, uh, we're, we're collaborating with the, um, one of the co-founders of Llama Index. Um, and he mentioned the fact that, hey, you, know, you guys have a rich, vibrant ecosystem. You have docs. You have people that understand this, can, and you have a lot of labeled data that you have. Um, what about folks that are just starting or don't have the time slash don't want to invest in creating data sets? Um, so there's, there's a lot we can do in terms of cold start. So again, this is where a good chunking comes in handy. So let's say you chunked your data. Um, you can now use chunks of your data to now generate questions. So uh, for this one, I think we would take a specific chunk of text. We would ask a, a good quality LLM like GPT-4. Um, you know, given the, the source of the answers, generate some queries. This is a very noisy approach. So our kind of additions we would do is you can do this. Maybe uh, isolate what chunks of data is actually being looked at to generate the questions. So that's, that's the first thing you should do. Second thing actually look at the questions and take out the ones that maybe don't make sense. Some of them are just going to be super basic and things that your users will never ask. Um, and the third thing that uh, we found was the questions are kind of basic, right? And maybe you can use some prompting to generate more intricate questions like what users would ask. But usually it's like, this is fact A, and, and the question will be like, what is fact A? And it'll just be a copy paste. So you're, you should be a little bit more creative. But this is a great way to start. Um, but very quickly, you can use this to seed a version one or a version zero of your application, put it on staging, have real people use it, and then now start using that to generate actual data and actually labeling that. So um, if you don't have a lot of time, this is still a great way to start to actually get towards high quality data sets. And there's a nice bootstrapping aspect here. Um, unrelated to this, but like um, at the beginning, you start with a completely clean slate, right? And then you have this data set, um, and then you start hand labeling, like where would I answer this? But then once you have the first version, you can actually like um, use larger data set, use the system to annotate, and then check. It's much easier to check if the answer is actually provided in the context. Um, so that's, that's like a good way to get things boot bootstrapped. Yes. OK, we actually just have 10 minutes left. Yes? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, number of examples for a cold start. Um, for our eval set, we had over 200 samples. And then we'll talk about the classifier that we trained for LM routing. For that, we had 2,000. Um, I think it's really context-based here. Uh, like, if you can't, we have a training session on Wednesday for where we actually teach how to build this. We do 10 samples. You can't really do it. It's not a good idea. We just do it because of time. Um, but I, th I think you're going to need a couple hundred, at least. Um, to get a good sense. But more important than the number, you want a good spread of queries across different parts of your product. So for us, you know, we want questions about core, infra, train, all of, all of these different pieces. So um, like kind of testing machine learning models, hopefully you can go back and have reports, not just overall evaluation, but like evaluation on different parts of your product as well. Um, so yeah, you want to have a good spread. OK, um, hmm. running out of time. So maybe we'll do this part quickly. Uh, I was going to ask whether what people think context helps or not. It does. Uh, so RAG is definitely the right way to go here. Um, big jump in 
kind of quality here for this one. Um, and so there's a lot of sanity checks along the way, like with no context, obviously retrieval score is zero. Uh, chunk size, what do people think here? Bigger, better, or is there, yeah, do people think it kind of tapers off? Any kind of predictions? Is it is smaller? Okay, this man says smaller, smaller. Anyone going for a really? Huh? Oh, okay, nice, okay, that's, uh, got some hints. No one's going for bigger is better for the chunk size? Oh, we have a couple, a couple of folks there, okay. It's also uh, relative for biggest, I guess. That's true, that is true. Um, so for us, uh, in terms of retrieval, you can see kept going up and then, again, this is empirical for our data set, might, could be different for you, but in general, we expect retrieval score to go up, um, but it starts tapering off and quality actually continues to go up here, um, but uh, you can see the difference between uh, don't necessarily continue at the same rate as the chunk sizes are increasing. Um, One thing that was definitely special about our data set is there's a decent amount of code snippets. Yeah. And so if you get the whole code snippet, that's very good. So like um, either you take a longer context to include the code snippet or you have some special chunking logic that tries to get the whole code snippet. Yeah. Uh, number of chunks, takers for don't use too many, use as much as you can. Oh, yeah, what do you think? As much as you can, okay. All right, let's see. Yes, so uh, at least, you know, we kind of, again, going back to your, that gentleman's question over there, we uh, eventually stopped at seven because uh, we wanted to respect the context links of these LLMs, so we could have continued to feed in more, but it would be truncated. Um, but for us, in general, we found more context, uh, more number of chunks is better, both for the retrieval score, obviously, um, but certainly for the quality score as well. Even there, kind of the increase in quality uh, starts to taper off as well. But in general, I think we're gonna, we already see, but we're gonna see more of a trend for LMs with larger and larger context windows. Uh, there's a lot of open source efforts happening here as well, so internally we're experimenting with you know, techniques, we're going to experiment with techniques like rope and others to try to extend this as much as we can. Um, if other folks are working on this, definitely reach out to us, because this is uh, one of the things that it's top of mind for us. Yes? Yes, oh, so uh, great question, I forgot to mention. Um, when you're doing like a, this is kind of like hyperparameter tuning, but like uh, component tuning as well, you could do the whole spread, and you, sometimes you have to multiply things to make sure it fits in the context window, et cetera. Uh, we decided to fix things along the way. So first we'll experiment with context, no context, then like the chunk size. Once we decide on which one's good, we fixed it there. Um, so that's, uh, you, can, you can certainly do it this way, but you can also open it up uh, completely and do it that way. So when we did this, we fixed the chunk size to a 500 at this point. So we did the same for uh, embedding models as well. The big takeaway here uh, is that if you guys look at the Hugging Face um, leaderboard, you'll find that GTE base is actually one of the smallest models. It's in the top five now, I think. I may be wrong. Um, but it's actually more, at least for our use case, we found it to be more performant than number one on the leaderboard. So uh, I guess the takeaway here is don't strictly go with what you see as number one. Sometimes it could be just like a giant model. And yeah, maybe you perform well on the benchmarks that they're testing. And they test on quite a few, right? I think it's like five or six different dimensions and tasks. Um, but do it on your own uh, kind of use case here and just see how it performs. Um, and we compared it with open, uh, sorry, OpenAI's uh, uh, text embedding as well. Um, and we were able to uh, decide to use the smaller open source one. Okay, and as for the, uh, the main, so everything is fixed along the way. Now, finally, with the LLMs, uh, you know, we, we tested out uh, these options here. Um, because we fixed everything, retrieval score obviously doesn't change at this point. That logic is fixed. Um, but for the quality score, you can kind of see it all here. GPT-4 was the clear winner here, but um, actually 70B and 3Fi Turbo, you know, they're not too far behind. Um, and also, there's no tuning done of any kind, right? No, no fine tuning on the embedding side or these LLMs uh, yet. Um, yeah. Awesome, and as for the cost analysis, um, for G chat GPT models, we're using OpenAI. For the open source ones, uh, for Llama, we're using any scale endpoints. Um, kind, of kind of a shopping, shocking factor here. Uh, the, the, the plot in the bottom here is quality score and on the, the y-axis is actually uh, cost, but at log scale. Um, so you can see here that GPT-4 is definitely uh, much further, a uh, lot more expensive, but quality-wise, um, the others are, are, are relatively close. But 
as I mentioned in the morning, we, we kind of wanted to combine the best of both worlds. We wanted to serve uh, the most performant, but also the most cost effective. So that's uh, when we employed this hybrid LM routing approach. Um, Phil, do you, if you wanted to say a few words about this one. So in this case, we just um, annotated a data set with um, which model was better, and then we tried to classify her. Um, and there's, I think, many different techniques. It depends a lot on the, um, I think, honestly, like, um, in this case, the main difference was if there's, like, a lot of code things involved, then GPT-4 does a lot better. Um, I think if you study your examples a lot, then you can come up with, like, good rules here, and, and also a rule-based approach should do pretty well. Um, yeah. Um, and I got some, we got some feedback on the blog post. I haven't updated this yet, but there is a classifier. Actually, number four in the, in the blog post, I write, I write out that we use a classifier, but we trained a classifier. We had around 1.8, uh, sorry, 1,800 data samples where we would say which, for the given query, which of these uh, LLMs you should go to. And then we, we trained a supervised classifier to be able to learn this. Um, and for this, you know, Ray Train, Tune, all of these were, uh, just made, made all that super easy. Um, I think we, what did we end up using, Philip? We tried with Spacey first, and then I think, um, actually, I, we just ended up using a simple logistic with softmax slapped on, but depending on your use case, I think I wrote, if there's more complexity or more binning, uh, maybe you might need to use something a little bit more, but still smaller than an LM, like a BERT model, and, and tune that. Um, we also tried BERT and binnings. Um, I think our data set was a little bit too small. Yeah. Um, but we have more data, so we'll, we'll try that again. We'll try that again, yeah. And someone this morning asked me, like, oh, you know, what, do we have to use classifiers for this? No, uh, you could use an LM here as well, but we, we don't want our users waiting, like, you know, two minutes for a response. So uh, we have, we have a, 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 let's say, a certain SLA that we want to stick to for how long we think a user should wait for. We're never going to go past that. So to make that happen, we use a classifier here. But I think as LLM inference gets faster, I don't see any reason why we can't use LLMs to maybe make some of these judgment calls as well, especially when maybe things can't be easily binned across, or if you want to get responses from all the agents and get them all and try to do something from there. So um, this is kind of just like the beginning. Uh, I think there's a lot more that can be done with just like the concept of routing and all the different components you can use in routing. And I'll just kind of end with this. Um, you saw uh, Sophia in this morning who had AnyScale Doctor. That was an application that's built on many components, including what we built as one of its many agents. This is another major theme that's already been happening. I think we're gonna see more and more of this. Um, and, and now, like, you know, using Ray and AnyScale to actually take something like this to production, I think is gonna be a, a big change in our field. Um, but yeah, I think those are, those are all the slides I wanted to cover today. We have about a minute left. Um, but if people have questions, we can do those. Uh, definitely check out the uh, blog post. Uh, all the code is open sourced as well. Um, and we're, I think we're going to have part two, maybe more parts coming as well in the next couple weeks slash months. Um, but there's a lot of things that are top of mind for us. We're, we're going to be focusing on a, on a few of them. Um, but there's, there's just so much that can be done here. The, I think the big takeaway we want to leave everyone here with is that um, iteration is key here. We built something out. We get it out. We get feedback. You have to iterate on this. Um, uh, you know, when Philip mentioned this first, it kind of reminded me of like the Tesla flywheel. Uh, there's a lot, iteration is absolutely key here. And eventually we can get to a state where vast majority of use cases are covered and there'll be very fewer and fewer touch points coming from us. But in the beginning, there's a lot of hard work in terms of uh, what it takes to build something like this that will actually answer people's questions. And also one thing here is I think using this um, sort of as a, as a way to improve your documentation, your underlying documents, that can be very powerful. I've heard multiple people say this now, and we also um, have seen this, like if you can, if you see the wrong answers and you see which documents fed in, and then, and then sometimes you actually discover like errors and things in the documentation, so that, that can be very useful. <clears throat> yeah, awesome, so that's everything, and yeah, we'll be around. People have questions afterwards.